Good afternoon, my name is Mike Tez. I'm coming from you today to talk a little bit about this coronavirus that we're hearing so much about and it's causing so much unrest and panic all over the world. And uh, I talked to one of my good friends, Dr. Jose Z. Garcia. He's one of the smartest people I've ever met in my life. And I, we started talking about this and I was stunned how much information he had on what was going on and how he brought into it something I've not heard about yet. He started talking about the border region and the border plex. And I said, Dr. Garcia, we need to get on TV and we need to take this message out. I think the information you have is something people haven't heard about. And it is absolutely vitally important to us in the community we live in. Dr. Garcia, thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, great. Uh, Dr. Garcia, could you First of all, let us know who you are. Well, I've been a college professor for most of my adult life, and uh, at, I taught in the government department at New Mexico State for over 35 years. Um, and then I did a stint with, uh, as the Secretary of Higher Education um, under the uh, Martinez administration um, for four years. and. Um, I was chairman of the Democratic Party way, 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 way back in the very early 1980s. And right now I'm retired and um, doing a blog on uh, many topics, but basically the U.S.-Mexico border, New Mexico, and, and, and politics. You've been involved in the border region as long as I've known you. You've been uh, one of the people we'd call and ask information who want to know about the border region. You've been one of the experts that we've contacted to ask about it. Uh, Dr. Garcia, could you give us a review of the status of the coronavirus in the U.S.-Mexico border area? Well, let me begin by stating um, for the record that I am not an expert on coronavirus. I'm not a medical doctor, and I, so I have no credentials in that uh, respect. I'm a political scientist, uh, but for the last month, I decided I would look carefully at the progress of coronavirus. I really got started uh, because I was interested in this whole thing of supply chains in the uh, maquila industry because they were being interrupted because they couldn't get product supplies from China. But then it blossomed into something I had no idea when I started doing that a month ago that a month later I would be trying to keep six foot distance from everybody else. That's how far we've come in the last month. So let me start with the status of where we are. In this region, in New Mexico, um, we have found, I think, 43 cases of coronavirus throughout the whole state uh, as of today. And one of those cases was discovered again today here in Las Cruces. El Paso has six discovered cases that they've uh, uncovered. And Juarez has, I think, two or three cases that they're either under investigation. I think the last official count was only one. This doesn't mean, though, that coronavirus is not here. And the reason why we don't know a whole lot about the status of coronavirus here at the border is because we have not been testing. New Mexico statewide has conducted 3,814 tests as of this afternoon, um, and that's the most. El Paso has conducted very, very few tests, I think probably a dozen or two at the backs. Wow. And Ciudad Juarez, basically the same. So everybody's trying to ramp up to find out what we can do more with testing. So I guess I should probably explain why testing is so important. Testing is considered by epide epidemiologists to be probably the single best indicator of where we're at, particularly at the beginning phases of a pandemic. 
because you need to know where in this cycle are we, how fast is it multiplying, where is it multiplying, which geographic areas, so that you can then go in, isolate the problem, send in supplies, send in doctors, send in ventilators, send in hospital beds, whatever you need for that geographic area. The only way that we can find this out is by extensive, massive testing. There's another reason why testing is so important with this particular virus, coronavirus, and that's because a significant amount, we're not totally sure how many, but a significant amount of people with coronavirus are transmitting it, but they don't have any symptoms. How scary is that? That's very scary because in some cases that they've seen in France and other countries, Italy, um, up to 50% of the, of the coronavirus cases may be transmitted without any symptoms, or at least not yet. So the only way that we can test is massive testing. The only way we can find out where we're at is massive testing. So unfortunately in this area, we haven't had a lot of testing capability. This is a nationwide problem. South Korea, I think, is testing 10,000 cases per day. Wow. And they've gotten control of it. So people talk about flattening the curve. South Korea was able to flatten the curve, especially because they were testing extensively. They knew exactly where it was. And when they found a case, they interviewed people and isolated those people and were able to get on top of it. And also when you have an outbreak in a certain area of town or an area of the country, you can know that, that you have to isolate that, that area and then send supplies in if you get a peak. So testing is absolutely, definitely an extremely important component of understanding what's happening, particularly at the beginning stages. Now, we hope that we're at the beginning stages. Yes. But in Las Cruces and Juarez and El Paso, we're not sure. Why is it taking so long to get the test? You know, Las Cruces barely started today. They had a line from the Department of Health to Loman of cars waiting for the test. Why, why aren't we testing larger numbers and why is it taking so long? Well, we don't really know. What we know is that the first test kits that were done by the CDC were faulty. And now what I understand from the governor's office is that some of the materials that go into those tests were not very reliable. So what we're trying to do now nationwide is to get the ability to test extensively and rapidly. How is South Korea able to test 10,000 people a day? I don't know. I wish I had And are their answer. kits, why have we not reached out and gotten their kits or find out what kit are they using or is it the faulty kit also? I don't know. I cannot answer those questions. What I do know is that from reports, South Korea is testing extensively, mm -hmm. has been testing extensively, and we haven't been until recently. And I know that CDC has been trying to ramp up. Uh, Roach, I, I guess, uh, the company has tried to ramp, ramp up. And uh, right Italy? now, in New Mexico, Tricor is testing. Okay. And um, Presbyterian Hospital is testing. And so we're ramping up that capacity to test. New Mexico is actually doing much, much better at testing for coronavirus than Juarez or El Paso. For example, yesterday in the newspapers, it turned out that Chihuahua is now, just now, getting the capabilities of testing 400 people. Oh my goodness. They do have a machine that can test 10 at a time. Wow. So they may be able to ramp up, but 400 for a state with 3 million people is not enough to no, begin to understand that. So. 
in Juarez, they've been testing only people that had flown off of, that come back from China mm -hmm. or Italy or some European country that was hot. And they were testing them extensively. And they didn't, for the first few couple weeks, they didn't find any. Uh, and now they're beginning to find some as they test a little bit more extensively. El Paso is in a similar condition. If you look at their website today, the health department over there, they've just received, they have the capacity to test 400 people. So they and Juarez are pretty much equivalent in their capacity to test right now, today. Hopefully, they're going to be able to get a lot more tests. Would that be based on the amount of people coming from that part of the world that they're is it deemed an area that's not at high risk because of the amount of travel? Or why are we, you know, New York is testing, you know, the larger states are tested pretty incredible amounts of people. Well, New York is a hot spot. So and that's why they're focusing on so hot is Seattle. Spots. Yes. So is, okay. is San Francisco. So, yeah. The places test, that the travel is heavier at, they're You test testing. those. Yes, got it. Yeah. But we have not been testing here, um, in spite of some suggestions that we are a hub and there is a lot of possibility for transmission of diseases in this area. For example, I looked at the um, flights coming in from uh, El Paso, uh, coming into El Paso on Wednesday, that's two days ago. There were 51 flights. One of them was from Seattle, one of the hottest spots in the United States right now. So I don't know if those people were tested. I don't know if their temperatures were taken. I don't know what happened to them. But that, that's 51 flights that came into El Paso on Wednesday from all parts of the country. Juarez has an international airport as well, Abraham Gonzalez. And the Abraham Gonzalez International Airport received 31 flights on Wednesday from all over Mexico. And again, we don't there know. Mexico no City exactly. is a city Mexico of over City's 20 million. And there are people coming in from all over the world. So again, we're not quite sure what happens to those people as they get off the airplane. Now, the real matter here on the border isn't even so much these airports. The airports are relatively small compared to, let's say, Atlanta, mm -hmm. which is also quickly becoming a hotspot. What is critical here about the potential transmission of the disease is the fact that this year, the Paso del Norte region, with all the bridges in El Paso and Santa Teresa, will export and import over $110 billion wow. of goods. Now, that goes, most of that is coming in on train and then taken off onto trucks and then trucked into Juarez or vice versa. And so we have a, an enormous amount of traffic, thousands and thousands of trucks each month coming through those borders. And we don't know but those truckers cross that border. We don't know where they go, and we're not sure. But if one of them, let's say coming from a hot spot like New York, comes through here and spends the night in El Paso, exactly, or spends the night in Las Cruces, or spends the night in well, Juarez. These trucking companies here are all over the country. Right. Yeah, I've seen uh, the Sea of Valley Transport in New York City when I was there. Absolutely. It's one of the bigger trucking you know, companies. We're getting ready to go to a commercial break. So hold that thought. We've got a lot to talk about here. So don't go away. We'll be right back after this commercial break. Hi, I'm Ray Bamberg with Here on Earth. I would like to invite you for a free hearing evaluation to our office. 
We've been here in southern New Mexico for 34 years helping people hear better. Call Mark Goldstein, the safe money guy, at 575-556-2472 to learn about innovative strategies now available to help you grow, protect, and preserve your money and financial future regardless of market conditions. Welcome back. Uh, my name is Mike Tez. I'm here today with Dr. Jose Z. Garcia, and we're talking about the coronavirus and the effects of this area. Dr. Garcia, finish what you were, we were talking about here. Well, let's talk a little bit about the spread of this and how fast it spreads. There was a piece in the Washington Post this morning that said it took three months for coronavirus infections to reach 100,000 globally from the first time that we detected it in China until it reached 100,000. It doubled to 200,000 in the next 12 days. Wow. So this thing is spreading very, very rapidly. That's another reason why we need really solid testing to understand where it's spreading and how fast that spread is going. So uh, testing, again, is about the only way that we know to do that. The other thing is that this is not likely to be a two or three month thing. This is in for the long run. The last pandemic that came close to being as virulent and dangerous as this one, was the Spanish flu, oh, Lord. which attacked one out of four people in the, in the world, wow. got the Spanish flu. And so we're talking about a very, very contagious thing. So it's real aggressive. The Spanish flu lasted three years, almost exactly three years. So what happens with these pandemics, as I understand that, again, I'm not an epidemiologist, but from what I've read, what happens is they tend to spike. The first spike is very extensive and it goes way, way up and then comes down. But then, let's say typically, which happens with just the ordinary flu, is that it'll spike sometime in February, March, and then it goes down as the spring comes, kind of lays low in the summer, but comes back in the fall. And that's what happened with the Spanish flu, it came back. And then it came back again. And so it, it may come back in the fall, then it's gonna hit again in the spring. Then it's gonna lie low and then it'll come back. The second spike tends to be the most dangerous where most people die when, who, who were eligible to die. Mm -hmm. And the third one is, is much more mild. In the Spanish flu case, this took approximately three years, about almost exactly three years to work its way out. Now, we don't know mm -hmm. how long this is going to last. Thank God for technology today, huh? We don't know if we're going to have a, a vaccine for it mm -hmm. that's effective within a year, year and a half. So we may be able to cut it short or at least cut the um, bad side effects to it. Uh, but So there's a lot of unknowns, but wow. we do know that this is very unlikely to be resolved in a short period of time. And what about the cooperation between the three subregions in uh, Paso del Norte? Well, so far, um, there is very little evidence of cooperation, although I, I, I need to qualify that a little bit. But what I would say is this. 20 years ago, the United States and Mexico reached an agreement and they created a border health commission. Mm -hmm. I'm familiar with that. And it was created precisely to be able to share, cooperate, prepare for things like pandemics, and to exchange protocols, to have common standards, so that if a pandemic struck, people would understand what to do. And um, unfortunately, I've been looking on the web at the websites for the for them, and I can't find any evidence that there's any activity at all. 
So I don't know if they lost their funding or what happened to the Board of Health Commission, but they certainly are not at the forefront wow. of the fight on coronavirus. So that's one thing. We don't have these protocols in place. We've done it before. Um, there was a case in the mid-90s in which here in Paso del Norte region, people got together. At that time, there was a lot of pollution. Basically, there was a lot of rubber tires being burned mm -hmm. in Juarez. There was the Asarco stack that was still polluting things. That. And the air up here in Las Cruces was pretty bad. So what they did was they created a common air shed. The people of southern New Mexico, El Paso, and Juarez got together. They created a task force to look at this. They bought instruments to measure uh, the, the amount of pollution. And when it got to dangerous levels, they then had monitoring stations spread all over mm -hmm. the region. And when a certain level of toxic stuff came out, then that tripped some alarms and officials would be notified, actions would be taken to slow that down. It was extremely successful. We all, I was involved in trying to create a water task force, which lasted for about 10 years. I remember, and, I'm familiar with that. And we, we got people from El Paso, Juarez, and southern New Mexico to see if we couldn't go out. We got one river in the middle of the desert, mm -hmm. two countries, and three states, and several different communities, and there was absolutely no cooperation. So we made an effort to create more, uh, more opportunities. Those efforts, sometimes they come and go, and for a lot of reasons, that thing uh, has not been functional. But here in, in, in this area, we really need to do something about health, and it's too bad that we haven't been doing anything. Because well, it's it nice to have the mayor let us know that they're working with uh, DeMargo in El Paso and that they're making something, they're working together to make something happen here. Well, the relations between the two countries have not been optimal, except in the area of trade uh, in the last few years. And for whatever reason, it hasn't happened. I was pleased to see uh, Mayor DeMargo, mm -hmm. um, day before yesterday, get on television and say, we need to start approaching this as a regional effort. Right. The only problem is it's very late in the middle of a pandemic to actually be able to put everything in place. Right, they should have done that a of it. month ago. So, well, it should have been done years ago, really, mm -hmm. because these things take a lot of time to get everything in place. But, so right now, um, hopefully, I think um, officials, health officials, and maybe uh, mayors, uh, and, and, and other public officials from, from the three areas, southern New Mexico, uh, El Paso, and Juarez, will be able to get together, exchange views, exchange information. One of the things that we are lacking in our area is we're not getting communication about our area right now. People are guessing, hitting, missing. They're listening to the news, different websites. So we need news from our area area to let us know what's going on right here. Uh, the panic, uh, you know, what is the economic impact going to be in this region? Uh, you talked about all the commerce going back and forth. What's going to happen right there? Well, the economic impacts are going to be very, very severe. They have already stopped the oil, some of the trade. Between have they closed the uh, bridge? I believe that they are in. The, they were supposed to be closing at some time. And does today. that mean pedestrians coming back and forth across? What they're trying to do, I believe, is that the United States has unilaterally said only American citizens can use these bridges. But does should to everyone stay out of there? No one is exempt from this virus. Well, what is very clear also is that the trucks are going to continue going through. Now, that's a hard, that's a tough that, call. That is who they should be testing. They should be testing Test at the bridge. Bridges. They need to do something to make sure that Absolutely. whoever does cross. But again, if you have a situation wow. where you can test negative or you have no symptoms, you have no fever, 
There's no way of knowing, but you may still be transmitting oh, wow. this. Dr. So Garcia. This is gonna go through. As amazing as, I've learned one thing about this program is how fast time goes. Um, in, you know, we'll, we'll close it, hit a few areas, and uh, we need to do this again, because there's too much information to put into 30 minutes, but you know, the border region, real quickly, what is the border region? What does that mean? Well, the U.S.-Mexico border is kind of undefined. Are we the border region? Well, for some purposes, it's 100 miles on each side. 100 miles on each side. Um, for the purposes of the uh, checkpoints, uh, for the border patrol, it's at mile marker 27, wow. north of Las and Cruces. And should we be worried? About coronavirus? Yes. We should be very worried about coronavirus. We don't need to panic. Ask, don't panic, which we're but saying. The best way to deal with this is to have more and more knowledge exactly. about what it is. Keep that six foot distance, wash your hands, sanit we can do our part by just following the simple rules we're hearing. Citizens can do their part by keeping and a distance. And real quick, I want to, this has become something that is out, you know, these little masks, we got, you know, four or five dollars. I'm seeing them for 40, 50 dollars a mask right now. You know, we, we need to quit panicking. I see the grocery stores panic, toilet paper. I don't know how that connects to coronavirus, but there is next to none. I went to a small store this morning. They had the small packs of water, six ninety five a pack. It said limit two. Toilet paper, a dollar thirty five a roll, limit two. Um, we need to quit panicking. We need to be vigilant, wash our hands. And if you don't have to go out, don't go out. Keep our distance, six foot distance, wash your hands. If you have sanitizer, use sanitizer on a regular basis. Dr. Garcia, I'd like to thank you. I can't tell you how, how excited I was to get your phone call the other day. And I definitely would like to get us back over here again. And we need to, we need to break, keep this news and keep current with what's going on. And I'd like to, you know, I'm going to talk to him. Maybe we get up here next week and keep something going. But we thank you for your information. And I'll tell you, it's been a blessing hearing from you. And, you know, in, in closing, I'd like to ask people, you know, I'd like to ask them to pray with me. And I'm going to say a prayer. It's Psalm 91. And I'd like for you all to join me in this. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge, my fortress, my God, in whom I trust, because He loves me, says the Lord. I will rescue Him, I will protect Him, for He acknowledges my name. I'll tell you something, what keeps me going every day is I look up. I pray to God, I thank God for Jesus Christ every day, and I pray to God, and I thank God for that protection. And you know what, if anything I can say, Pray to God. Pray to God. Look up and not only out. My name is Mike Tez. I want to thank you for joining us today. And we'll see you again real soon. Dr. Garcia, thank you. Well, thank you for having me.